Okay, um, so you're going to have to forgive me. I can normally do this talk, but it's been a long time, um, long couple of days. Um, the challenge is I'm going to write a complete game in like five minutes, but it's like four minutes, 42 seconds now, so I'd better get moving. Um, so the first thing I need to do is you're create a window. Ah. <laughs> so first thing I need to do is create a window. Um, and if I... Uh, uh, that's not the one. That's the one. Okay, now I'm going to have to type without seeing what I'm typing. Um, <laughs> This isn't fair. Um, I'm not eligible for the prize, so don't vote for me. Um, uh, can I have a countdown? So hopefully, if I type that right, um, I can go to the terminal and something should appear. Only it's appearing on the wrong screen. Um, <laughs> I have a window. Yay! Um, so since I've got like three minutes left, I'm going to cheat a little. Um, let's see, um, <laughs> I can't see the mouse, there we go, um, <laughs> I'm really fast at typing, um, we should also, so we're creating um, a couple of sprites and some sound, we're putting the sprite in the center of the screen, and we are also, um, yes, we've got two minutes. We're going to draw it on the screen. So, in theory, if I run it and watch it appear on the wrong screen again, um, you can now see I have a monkey and a hand. Um, hands behind the monkey. You can see I render it after the monkey, so it um, before the monkey. So, um, two minutes. Oh, I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, if this wasn't so hard with the mouse, I probably could type this, but I'm not going to risk it. Let's make the monkey, sorry, the fist move when, um, when the mouse moves. So as you can see, I just import the mouse, bind it together, tell the sprite to go to the position where the mouse is. Um, here, mouse. Um, again, on the wrong screen, you annoying thing. But you can see, now I have a fist that moves. Ha ha! Um, but I can't punch the monkey yet. Um, which is kind of annoying, because I don't like monkeys. Um, so, one minute! Ha ha! Um, um, okay, let's... Uh, where are you, mouse? You're on the wrong screen. Um, okay, we need to move the monkey because monkeys move. Um, let's see. 40 seconds. Um, so, monkey's moving. Yay. Okay. <laughs> now, 30 seconds. I, there's no way I'm going to be able to type this, so I'm going to keep cheating. Um, I might as well keep cheating because, you know, I've already cheated most of the way through. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is on the mouse press, I'm going to check if the two things collide. If it is, I'm going to play some sound. Um, and then I'm going to set the check thing. Oh, it's on the wrong screen! Oh, I 
I forgot to say. <laughs> it was grand effort. <laughs> and just to prove it actually works. You have to get off now. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> It was a valiant effort. Uh. <laughs> <Okay>. um. <laughs> yeah! I am not eligible because I'm an organizer and I cheated. <laughs> a lot. Right. Okay, um, now we're, we're talking about numpy mania. Right. Um, you've got the time? Yeah. So, does someone know what to press here to get the... Sorry? Tim is good at this. Can you help with this? Thank you. Just getting the image here in Linux. Yeah. Thanks. I'm afraid we're not going to get this working. Um, do you have a presentation that you can put on a disc? Um, okay, the next one. We're going to have to move up to the next one. Yep. Sorry. Web application performance. We'll switch to the Start the timer. Okay. I give up. <laughs> you have four minutes. So I'm going to talk about uh, my favorite Python module, which is NumPy. So it's supposed to be, wow. get when you try doing a demo. Web application performance monitoring. <laughs> Good, you can see it. Except I've lost the buttons. Okay. Uh, I used to work for the RTA. I worked there for over eight years. I got sick of it and I left at the end of last year. So I'm now working at a, uh, <laughs> a company called New Relic. They're based in the US. Um, 
And what we do, we do application performance monitoring. And if you were here in the room for the previous talk, uh, where Tennessee was talking about doing benchmarking, he was talking about doing benchmarking and unit tests. Uh, effectively, we're doing a sort of similar thing with collecting data, but on real production applications. And in our particular case, we're focusing on web applications. Uh, previously, they had uh, means of instrumenting collecting data for Ruby, Java, PHP, and .NET. Um, thanks to Noah Giff, who introduced me to them, um, they decided to hire me, and we'll have a go on doing a Python one. Uh, so, whereas with what Tennessee was talking about, where he was doing in, using C profile module to collect uh, performance data, we're doing more targeted instrumentation, which actually allows us to uh, collect data from a production app, not actually impact the overall performance of the application. So, and when we get that applica application data, we're reporting that live back to our core application. It's running a software as a service, so it's not post done. So here we have a, a view of our dashboard. That's the last 30 minutes of application time. So you're actually going to see your application data in real time, um, not something you have to go back later and get to. Uh, we can see things like how much time spent in database, uh, memcache, uh, how long request queuing, uh, external calls. Um, you can get things like slow transactions, uh, errors, and so on. Uh, so web transactions, you can also break down. We, we map URLs to actual meaningful information, meaningful things inside of the code. So here, particular one, we've got Django. We're mapping to view handler functions uh, rather than URLs. And that, therefore, allows you to get a breakdown of the performance of particular view handlers. And obviously, this is not dynamic, but you can actually click on each of those, and the graphs will change on the right-hand side to give you a bit more information on performance breakdown and other things on that. Uh, we also, in each uh, reporting period, will collect data on a slow transaction, which uh, usually by default is everything over two seconds, but that's uh, a configurable thing. Um, that's just a roll-up, but you can also then drill down into it. And again, we've done our targeted instrumentation of things that are interesting, typically with Django framework, but we do support other web frameworks as well. Uh, so things, all the, all the different middleware, uh, the view handler, you can see where the database time is being spent. In a particular case here, you can see a um, particular template node. Down the bottom is the thing that's actually taking a lot of the time. And if, if you start analyzing that, what you probably find is that uh, we've got a database query which is collected the data, and then the, all the time is actually spent in consuming that data from the database, and that's where all the time is taken up. Uh, database queries, we're also going to break down on that, uh, see where all the time is being spent, which queries are the ones which are most expensive. Um, all these metrics all over, uh, can be looked at with the graphs over time. Uh, for the top end account, we can go back to three months worth of data. Uh, other exciting one is that we're instrumenting your HTML that comes back from your web app to the browser. And so we're actually able to capture time uh, from information, stuff that's happening on the browser as well, what we call end user metrics. And so you can therefore see uh, how much time is spent in the network requests, how much in DOM processing, uh, how much in page rendering. And this is sort of much better approach than uh, some of the other ones because we're actually doing this for real customers who are using your web app. It's not a, like a, some of the uh, companies who do this where they'll have client machines all around the world and try and do the same thing, but that's not a real client. Well, this is for real customers. So we're currently in private beta. Uh, we've had more interest than we can handle at the moment. But if you're really, really eager, talk to me. Uh, and but hopefully, we're going to have something by the end of the year. That's the intention. And that's it. Well, <laughs> there may be an, an error in transcription here, but I'm sure it says scrape. It does. <laughs> so, yep, hi, I'm Anthony Baxter. This is what I do. I work at Google Crisis Response. What's Google Crisis Response? It's not about a data center falling over. It's about earthquakes, floods, fires, bad things like that comes under the google.org heading. What do we do? Well, amongst other things, whenever there's a big disaster, we do something like this. We put up a landing page with all sorts of fancy information. We basically collect as much information as possible, put it all online, make it easily accessible for everyone. We also do things like collect new satellite data um, from GOI-1. This is shots of Haiti straight after the earthquake. 
Um, I'm not here to talk about that stuff today because I've only got five minutes. I'm here to talk about some other stuff. This is a map we did earlier this year around the time of the Queensland floods. Uh, of course, they were then followed by the Victorian floods, followed by the WA fires, followed by Cyclone Yazi, followed by Tropical Cyclone Carlos, followed by Christchurch, followed by Japan. Um, the first three months of this year basically sucked for both me and for the general population of the Asia Pacific region. Um, but it's more about me right now. So um, <laughs> we also then, you know, pulled in data from the Bureau of Meteorology. That's Yazi going in to do that neat little bisection it did right between, uh, I think it was Cairns and Toowoomba. It was like awesome, it missed. Thank God for that because it was a bugger. Um, this is some of the data in the course of the first three months of this year that we managed to pull into that map. Um, all of it from different websites. Um, in a perfect world, this spatial information, generally disaster information, is about a place. You know, it refers to a place. It's spatial information. It generally, it, it, in a perfect world, it comes in in a nice open standard format, like KML, GORSS, or Common Alerting Protocol. In this world, I have a unicorn, I have a hovercraft, and every morning, the unicorn drives me to work in my hovercraft. <laughs> In a slightly less perfect world, which we mostly have, we have well-formed XML and HTML. We can use XML.etree to read that. Yeah, and then we start getting into the more fun stuff. We have not so well-formed XML and HTML. Everyone goes, just use beautiful soup. I would, but when we say not well-formed, we're actually not just talking about, oh, they've got an extra B tag. What we're talking about is the information itself is not well-formed. It's a list of place names with no lat longs. Okay, great, I can deal with that. I can geocode it. The place names have spelling mistakes. The formatting of the page is in fact one big lump of text that somebody's edited in Notepad and just put random formatting in. They've, say, done something like specified river road in the Shire of Greater Swan Hill. There are three river roads in the Shire of Greater Swan Hill. I wonder which one's closed. It's a flood, it might be the one near the river. Guess where roads called River Road usually live? <laughs> yeah, so basically it sucks. Um, we had a slight fix to that. We use something called Fusion Tables as an intermediate thing. It's a Google free thing you use. It's like a spreadsheet, but it has a uh, map view output. So when there's things that aren't quite right because somebody spelled it wrong, you can pop up a little map and move it around and fix it. Um, there's a project called Placemat, which is sort of a nice front end on top of Google, on top of, uh, Google Fusion Tables. It's pretty good. It does most of the things. I've got some stuff that'll take, you know, here's a set of information, here's a fusion table, and unify the two, you know, apply deltas, remove them. If somebody really wants it, nag me and I'll open source it. Um, get, give me a uni unicorn. If you guys can help with this stuff, because this stuff's shards, it, it's very easy to parallelize. There's lots of websites out there. If you find a government website or any random website, or if you're producing a government website, you know, you work for the RTA or something, make sure you produce the data in a useful, consistent format. Ideally, one of those unicorn-based uh, protocols, but at least put it in a nice standard format and tell me what the lat longs are. Don't make me guess. You know, this is public safety information. If you do that, we can do really cool stuff like this. This is, it's still alive. This is a map of road closures in Japan. The way we get this data is Honda's in-car GPS systems. Um, if you've got the Premier version, they aggregate the car locations and speeds over the course of a day. They ship the data to us. It's all aggregated over the course of a day, so there's no privacy things. And we then put it on a map. This is, as of now, you can see Fukushima. You can see the dead zone around Fukushima. Straight after the earthquake, civil government had collapsed. Nobody knew which roads were safe for trucks full of supplies. We were able to put this online, and everyone can see it. It's awesome. This is the sort of stuff you can do. <laughs> Speaking as someone who's tried to parse the government Hansard, make your data accessible. Um, okay, so now we have callbacks versus structured code. Bring it away. Bring it. Oh, mm, sensible. No slides. <laughs> okay, this is some um, more of a request for something awesome rather than a report of something that already is. Mike. And um, in some ways, this has been bugging me on and off for some years now. And um, it's the kind of thing that in five years, I'd like to see it on an extra slide in this morning's keynote. Basically, the 
problem is that we have structured programming. We have uh, functions, we have loops, while loops, for loops, we have if statements, we have exceptions, we have with statements, um, all these wonderful things. And what we actually use in practice is callbacks. These are like go-to on bad drugs. So really what we'd like is some sort of new structure or possibly several structure, structures that covers the use cases that we do with callbacks these days, which is mostly GUI programming and networking. I don't know, there's probably a couple of others that I'm missing, but these seem to be the most common ones um, where you end up with callbacks. And um, in one talk yesterday, there was the fairly reasonable paradigm of a callback, which as part of its logic changes which callback is being called for the same function which is fine and you know it's finite state machine no problem you have a nice diagram next to it in the documentation which you keep up to date but if you just look at the code it's that's spaghetti that's worse spaghetti than any go-to that you've ever programmed and there's a couple of glimpses of how it might look um, generators are sort of that thing, but they don't cover nearly everything. There's some experimental frameworks um, which work based on serializable continuations. So there's like a function which puts up a web page and then it saves the current state of the program in a file. And when the user clicks on the button, it unserializes it and returns from the function that did that for you. But these are experimental, fragile, they don't cover nearly all the cases and you can kind of do that for simple web programming but it won't do for your GUI program so we really need something new and I don't know what it is and if we make it it'll be awesome so we should like think talk discuss invent and in five years time when this morning's keynote is being given again about how Python is awesome. In the section with generators and with statements, there'll be a new slide, possibly two, with a new structure that makes Python awesome and gets rid of all this callback stuff. Uh, <coughs> Miriam. Miriam? Yep. Uh, now we're going to hear about Girl Geek Coffees. You need a dongle? Okay, everyone's helping. I'm everyone's sure. helping. <laughs> Geekdom 101. Oh, decided to sleep. No? What's it doing? Oh, it's uh, waking itself it's up. It's oh, look at the little beach ball spin. Beach oh. ball. Oh. You're all mirrored. It's great. Go for it. Go. Okay. You could plus one up all the way. Um, so I've gone to here, so you can watch the little pretty pictures when I talk. Um, so, Mike, hi. I mean, Mir I'm Miriam, not Mike. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm the founder of Girl Geek Coffees. Um, we have uh, chapters in all states in uh, Australia and also um, um, New Zealand, all major capital cities. And as you can see from the happy snaps there, that you can watch while I'm speaking. Um, it, it gets together a bunch of um, young females, uh, uh, which are predominantly students. Uh, it's unique because there's no other organisation which actually directs towards students. And um, so there's an organisation, FIWT, um, which 
nationally only has about 100 students on their books and um, doesn't even really canvas all the other states, which is a really big pity. Um, so, you know, the situation, why, why bother to actually collect, collect females and actually get them to say hi? The situation is that females aren't even doing that in their tutorials, they're not doing their lectures, um, and that's important because when they exit into industry, they won't actually have a cohort to network and support themselves with. So actually finding them, capturing them, and getting them to network at university level is critical. Um, from there, you can actually build in other programs like um, Pi Ladies or um, various other programming or multimedia things that you can reinforce those connections, reinforce their tech skills and get them integrated into um, existing groups like you guys. Um, so we can have a wonderful um, diverse contribution. So some of these pictures, that's actually from um, Monash University. So there's two groups in Melbourne. There's Monash University, combined RMIT and University of Melbourne. There's actually a startup this Wednesday in Sydney. Um, initial request. No. Uh, initial expressions of interest actually got 60 females which um, is pretty impressive. Um, a little statistic for this particular room, if there's 35 females, there's actually five Girl Geek Coffees members here, and um, that represents 14%. Of those five, there are actually, I believe, three diversity um, grants assisted to actually be here. So um, there's a bit of support to try and actually get girls here. Um, uh, any questions? <laughs> okay, done. Okay, um, right, back to its rightful owner. Um, now we have Danny talking about pie things. Pie Danny talking about yes. pie <laughs> things. Who's the other end of this guy? Whoa. This isn't even mine. <laughs> <laughs> that would have that would have ended badly. Uh, <laughs> can we see anything yet? No. Uh, anybody know how to do this whole detect displays thing? It's automatic. It's on the slideshow. It's not live. Okay. Awesome. So if I hit yes. turn it on, it's going now. Okay. Going. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, Oops, we lost it. There we go. Um, so um, I'm Danny. Um, I'm here. Thank you, everyone, for bringing us and, and being so awesome. Um, and this is my talk about the one way of Python. Uh, so um, we all know the 13th aphorism of Python, uh, which is you can see right there. Um, and you can link to it. Um, Oh, I'm not supposed to be saying um. So there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. Uh, and this is a, one of the aphorisms of the Zen of Python. I, I called it Cohen, but I think it was Richard Jones or Nick corrected me. <laughs> um, so uh, this, this applies to the implementation in core Python. Uh, I'm not going to go over what's on the slide. We all were there for Raymond's talk, I hope. It was awesome. We learned lots of cool stuff. Just, just think I'm, I'm channeling Raymond here. Um, we all follow the same protocols, it's awesome. Uh, uh, Graham Dumbleton and, and all those guys who have worked on giving us the ways to implement the protocols is awesome. But, but how far does this carry? Audrey um, ha raised this on Twitter, and, and I'm not gonna read it to you because I think everybody here is literate. And, uh, you know, and then people said, well, it, it you know, they, they dove down into it deeper and deeper. Uh, you know, is, is what happens when you have too many packages? What happens when there's not one good way to do it? In Python, in core Python, that's okay. But what about the third party library community? Uh, so for example, web frameworks. Um, is Zope the obvious way? Uh, 10, 11 years, the answer was, yeah, it, it is. But that's not the case anymore. There's other things. People had opinions. 
they didn't like the status quo and they made changes. Uh, one of the neat things, I mean, that we got out of Django that affected Pyramid was the culture of documentation. And I know Django core guys who will say when Django's dead, and it'll happen, unfortunately, um, just, and maybe it'll happen in Python, the documentation culture is gonna live on. That's the legacy of Django. Um, when we get into desktop GUI, I, I can't stand to Kenter or how do you take and see Kenter or whatever. Um, well, I, I blogged about this, I ranted. It's like, why, why is this in core Python? Um, and, and I understand it's portable, right? There's lots of other stuff out there. I've heard people argue that Pygame is like the best desktop GUI tool. I don't, I don't know if that's the case. I, I haven't done anything with it in a while. Image processing is kind of sticky. Algae raised, um, the love of my life, raised in our keynote, uh, scaling, encoding, and installation. And, and people, I, I know people on IRC and other places are saying, well, I, I have no problems with pill, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the experts complain. If you, I bet if we pulled out the, the WETA or WTA, as, as I say from the East Coast of the United States, um, they'll, they'll complain. I, I don't understand the problems, but they, they write their own image libraries for a reason. And installation of pill is not fun. Um, there's pillow, which is, um, which is a, a, a standard, standalone thing on the Python packaging index to let us do pill installations easily. And, and thanks Alex Clark for this, but it's not right. Um, pill, pill should not be this hard. And I don't think pill works on Python 3, does it? Anyone? Does pill work on Python 3? Okay, so you think not having the WSGI spec is hurting Python 3? The fact that our standard image library is not working in Python 3 is the bigger problem. Um, so, to the radical zenists about this, and I love you guys, because <laughs> Python's been really good to me. It brought me here. Um, let's look at the. Let's look back at the Zen of Python. Am I like moving too much? Okay, awesome. There's a ninth aphorism, and I'm misquoting it. It's in reference to something else, but I think it r is really important here. Sometimes. You know, the, especially in the third-party library community, if someone wants to do something different, then then encourage them. If that fills up the Python package index with a lot of stuff that you don't agree with or makes it hard to search, then we'll address that problem. That's a happy problem. We we have a wider, more diverse community. So that's it. That's my Python thingy lightning talk. Now we have Toxic Ryan. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got moved. No, no, this is a Linux uh, thing. It'll be a piece of cake. It'll just plug in. And, uh, there we go. Um, so this talk is actually penance for um, the two other talks I gave earlier today in which I was encouraging people to do things that they probably shouldn't do. Uh, is that readable enough? Yep. It's all right, okay. I won't, I won't f stop that, I won't fiddle with it. Um, so in real life, I am actually a serious developer who does serious things and takes his craft quite seriously. This is the XML, which is a project I was talking about in one of my talks earlier. And um, what's nice about this project is it's relatively small and it's pure Python, but it runs on Python 2.5, through to Python 2.7. Um, it runs on Python 3.2 and it runs on PyPy. Um, and I can say this with complete confidence because I have 100% test coverage across all of those platforms, which sounds like a lot of work, um, but is not as much work as you might think with some helpful tools, which I wanna show you today. So I have, uh, assuming this is all gonna work now, I have this set up so that I can run Python set by test, I have 35 tests that run. They're big tests, which is why there's only 35 of them. Um, I have it set up so that I can run coverage across them, and then it'll give me a nice report and tell me that, yes, you've got all of your statements covered and this sort of thing. That's, that's the setup.py file, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Everything under DXML is 100%. <laughs> I've only got 98% coverage on my tests. Um, which is fine, you know, if you're running that, you know, that's running against 2.7, which is my system Python, but I need to check that against all of these other platforms. So there's this great tool called Tox, 
Um, and if you're not familiar with it, you should become so because it's awesome. Uh, you can go here, talks.readthedocs.org. Um, and basically what you do is you write a little configuration file here and I say I want to test against the following environments 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 3.2 .2 and PyPy. Now I have all of those installed into my system paths um, so that Tox can find them. I basically give it the list of commands that I want to run. So I want to run my coverage tests and then generate a little report. Um, unfortunately coverage doesn't run under PyPy so I've customised that to just run the tests. Um, and basically all I do is run Tox and it's going to read that config file, it's going to look at my setup.py, generate an sdist, create a virtual environment for each of those different platforms, install my package and its dependencies into that environment, run my test suite and give me a report on what succeeded and what failed. Um, and as you can see, now that I've cut out the things that aren't my setup file, <laughs> um, so yeah, it runs on PyPy, it does its thing, that was my time, two minutes, good. Yeah, terrible. And yep, so all of my tests succeeded across all of those platforms. So once you've got that set up, you can uh, maintain and deploy these libraries with uh, a great deal of confidence. I'll show you a, the little trick in setup.py that, that makes this work, which is basically instead of just, you know, from distutils.core input setup, I've got a little try accept to say, if you've got setup tools available, use that, um, which on Python 3 will use distribute, obviously. And then down here, if I happen to be running on Python 3, I'll just switch on this awesome use 2 to 3 keyword, which means that when um, Tox comes along to install my project into Python 3, it automatically runs 2 to 3, applies all the fixes, and I get valid Python 3 code out the other end. So that's five platforms um, supported from one very handy little command line testing utility. Um, it's awesome. If you've got stuff on the cheese shop, uh, you should be using it for your tests. Thank you. him off. Uh, okay, love Python, try go. Oh. Who here loves Python? Well, then you should try go. <laughs> <laughs> Fell for it. Um, oh. Excuse me one second. This is going to bother me if I don't fix it. Whoa. Oh, this was a bad choice. You were going so well. <laughs> Did it work? It might have worked. <laughs> All right. My name is Andrew Drone and I work at Google Sydney. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about Go. What is Go? Um, so, Go is a general purpose language, um, it's compiled and statically typed but it has the feel of a dynamic scripting language. Um, it was developed, it's an open source project which is being developed by uh, a team at Google um, and also a bunch of contributors from the open source community. Um, Go builds fast. Um, typical programs in Go build in under one second, which means that you've got a short write compile test cycle, which means that you can be productive and happy and get things done. Um, Go code runs fast. Um, Go compiles to native machine code on a variety of platforms. And it also gives the programmer um, control over memory allocation um, and also the control flow. So if you write fast code, your code will run fast. So if you have performance critical code uh, or performance critical problems, then Go might be the language for you. Um, static typing rules. Um, static typing has a bad rep, a bit of grumbling when I mention static typing. Um, but the reality is that that's caused by um, pretty verbose languages that are kind of painful to use. I'm looking at you, Java. Um, but Go uses type inference, so it really takes the typing out of typing, if you'll forgive my terrible pun. Um, and so static typing, one of the key benefits is it prevents programmer error. Um, and static typing will save your bacon. How many times have you written your wonderful Python application and you've tested it and you deploy it and then within seconds of deployment you see this in your logs? Ever seen anything like that? Does that look familiar? These are the kinds of errors. No, never, of course, Anthony, never. <laughs> These are the kinds of runtime errors that can and should be caught at compile time. So while Go is statically, uh, statically typed, it feels dynamic. And this is largely the result of its interfaces. And Go interfaces are the, define a set of methods. 
and then any type which implements those methods implements the interface. And so it's this kind, you don't have to explicitly say my type implements this thing. It, you can sort of define interfaces after the fact. And this gives you this compile time sort of duck typing. You know, if it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it is a duck effectively. And so this encourages a nice separation of concerns and makes code uh, more composable. Um, Go has killer concurrency features. Uh, just before we heard a lightning talk about callback hell um, and, and asynchronous programming. Um, Go's solution to that is uh, a system of lightweight threads called Go routines that intercommunicate um, with channels, which are like typed conduits. Um, and these, uh, this construct is based on communicating sequential processes, a work by CIR Hoare in the early 70s. Um, and they were a very natural way to express concurrent algorithms and concurrent processes. Um, it's been said that lo the locks and threads style of, um, of multi-threaded programming is to Go's model of programming like what go-tos are to if statements, for loops, and functions. Um, so Go is simple. Um, each language feature in Go is really easy to understand in and of itself. And then the interaction between language features is predictable and consistent. And this is a deliberate design goal to make Go really easy to learn and really easy to understand, really easy to read and to work at scale. Um, Go has great tools. So uh, we have GoDoc, which, reads, which is just like PyDoc. We have GoTest, which is a testing framework. All our code's well tested. Um, we have GoFumt, which automatically formats Go code. Go install installs third-party libraries. And GoFix, which is a really killer feature, is whenever we change core APIs, um, we provide a tool that automatically rewrites Go code to adjust to the new APIs. Um, Go runs on App Engine. Um, a couple of months ago, we announced general availability for Go on App Engine. And it's also great for web apps in general. This is a Hello World web app written in Go. It's uh, less than 10 lines of code. It says hello slash whatever you put on the, on the path. So this just demonstrates Go as being a succinct language. And finally, uh, Go has the coolest mascot. Um, it's the gopher. This is the plush version. He rules. And finally, Go will be, su Go will be successful. Raymond this morning said that these were the criteria for a successful language. This is what we have. Please check it out. Talks. So these are really fast. Um, starting with Roy, pydoc.net, three minutes. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> people. Um, my name is Roy. Um, it won't do the screen if you're... Yeah, I need the screen. Not, if you're not logged in. Oh, yeah. uh, my name is Roy again, and I did a little bit uh, C and Perl and PHP, then I switched to Python eventually uh, last year. Um, I love Python. It's ease of use and you know takes care of all the memory controls and everything. Um, so I want to give something back to Python, and I thought, uh, you know, what I can give back within a year that I'm not really experienced with the Python language. Uh, so after I bought my ticket to that conference, I start to um, think about how is it difficult for us, the new learners. Um, within Python if you, are, if you are using a package that you are not familiar with. Let's say um, you want to pick a package, um, was it Flask? That you want to, you want to learn it, but it's, it's, uh, where you can go is read the docs and, um, so it's not the technical way of uh, copy pass that I can just copy my uh, let's say import import code from here and can't 
I can't I can't get the source code or, or the documentation all itself. This is more like mastering and you know using a single package itself. But um, I thought it would be awesome if I can just create a if I can just create a prototype that goes like pydoc.net. Uh, by the way, it's prototype and it, uh, we got it working this morning, so it might explode. It might give you know blue screens and everything. Please you know be understanding and uh, so. What you do simply you can type or you can pass your import string and you can directly go to it's it's a, yeah a lot of indexing problems. What was it? Flask. Yeah. So you go to it's very simple. You go to package information. Uh, you get all the meta information. It's just a prototype. You can explore through the packages uh, modules and. I haven't, you know, indexed all those classes and functions, but it's useful if people will keep using it, and I will uh, promise that I will keep improving it. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, take your laptop. Whose was this? That looks awesome. Uh, that was yours? No, oh, it was. Okay. I've got a three minutes walk, Anthony. Sorry, um, hang on. Uh, the announcement. Uh, so this is um, about LCA 2012. Ah. Okay. So this is an important public service announcement, everyone. So who here likes Python? Yes, you all like Python. Okay. So you've all come to PyCon. It's here in Sydney. PyCon Australia is a very small part of the world, right? Okay. But you know, there's a whole much bigger world of open source out there, and Python is only a really small part of that. Now, the parent organization of PyCon Australia is Linux Australia, and they run another conference, another open source conference, uh, called linux.conf.au. Now, despite the name, it's not actually a conference about Linux. Uh, I took a look at last year's uh, program, and look, there's all manner of things about open source. Um, you see on that list, like lots of open source, but on that list, I didn't see any Python. Um, so a couple of years ago, I, um, I ran something called the Open Programming Languages Miniconf when LCA was in Wellington. And we had a couple of Python talks in it, and it was really, really good. Now, uh, LCA moved from Wellington to Brisbane for 2011, and I dropped the word languages from the name of the Miniconf, but ran it, ran it again. I called it the Open Programming Miniconf, and there were no Python talks. So looking at that graph, you can see <laughs> massive drop in Python talks. You can see it in the data. In fact, this was the only contribution about Python in the entire mini-conf. <laughs> and he's right. But how can anybody tell this? I mean, all we can conf conclu conclude from this is that all the Python developers are in New Zealand, <laughs> and there are none in Australia, and we know this is wrong. We can do better Python people. LCA is going to Ballarat in uh, January of next year. I encourage you all to get along. Um, and we need Python talks for the Open Programming Miniconf. It's going to be running again, and the CFP is going to open within the next week or so. So how can you find out about when the CFP is open and how to submit your talks? Sign up to the Python AU mailing list or the Sydney Python mailing list, or follow me on Twitter. I'm Chris JRN. Thanks. Uh, WikiPy. WikiPy? WikiPy. Uh, okay, we've still got a few minutes to go, so I think we might get through all of them. Oh my god. Um, another three minutes? <laughs> yep. Oh, I don't know. Mine is No, we'll And I've still got at least ten minutes left on my battery, so it's not a problem. <laughs> uh, but it's not visible. Why is it not visible? Mm. Boring talk. Does next three minute I want to go while I like? Uh, the next one will be making the internet more better. I have no idea why that didn't work. Making the internet more better. I Excellent. couldn't think of a name for the, a title for the talk, so I came, went with the first thing that came to mind. Now let me just uh, see if this is going to work. There we are. So I've I'm Trent Davis, the CTO of Netbox Blue. 
Uh, what do we do? Our core products we call the Netbox Appliance. It does a bunch of things for the internet. We've got agents for Windows and Mac. Uh, we make the internet more better. We load balance internet connections. We do web filtering, monitoring, antivirus, anti-spam, quotas, caching, user management, Active Directory, app and open directory, e-directory. Uh, the coolest bit, we think, is our social media management solution. Normally Facebook is blocked at schools and the like. We say no, kids want to use it. It's quite important it's how kids communicate these days. So we want to allow access, but we don't want the bad stuff. No swearing, no bullying, no baddies online, those kinds of things. So we do that with a technology we call SafeChat. It covers Facebook, Twitter, email, Jabber, Gmail, Google Talk, MSN, Google, Bing, YouTube, Yahoo, and a few others. It actually interacts with the data stream and does some cool things such as blocking messages before they actually make it out to Facebook. So how do we do it? Real-time inspection, analysis of the Ajax and HTTP traffic. Lots of cool tools, it's all Python, a lot, a lot of Python. Um, we're developing a new product at the moment we're calling Cyber Safe House. It's for parents. Uh, kids are allowed on Safebook, but safely. Uh, happy parents, happy family. So we're doing stuff in the cloud, managed uh, from a bunch of cloud servers. It's going to involve lots of usage data of what's happening across all these users. Probably starting at 10 to 20 gigabytes of new data a day, and that amount of data per day is going to be increasing pretty quickly. It needs to be presented in re near real time to the users. Is it going to be challenging? Yep. Is it going to be fun? I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so we need more developers. We love our developers at Netbox Blue. We've done Python for 12 years. I don't think there's many companies that have done it for that long. Uh, you can use whatever OS you want on your desktop. Uh, we give everyone air on chairs. They're really comfy. Um, everyone gets dual 24 inch screens. We have a quiet environment. We've got a separate building for our development team. There's no Java. Lots of people in ragging on it. So. <laughs> Um, we are based in sunny Brisbane. It only floods every 30 years, so we're good. Um, so pl you know, please come work for us. We started and host the uh, Brisbane Python Meetup Group. If you're in Brisbane, please come and join us, whether you want to work for us or not. We do scrum with daily stand-ups. We have burn-downs. We do two-week sprints. We do actually do unit and integration testing, nightly builds. Your opinions matter. I actually try to listen. Um, I'm technical. I do understand what you're talking about when you speak to me. For more information, please come and see me. Uh, or whiteboard downstairs, I have my cards, or go to our website, I've got a short URL there, mbb.co slash pyjobs. Thank you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> make, uh, Silicon Beach, Australia. Yep, okay, this is our last talk, and then we'll do some other fun stuff. Looks like I have to hold it. It's actually a Windows machine. Alright, so my name is Bart. I um, started coding when I was six. It looked like that. Um, four years ago, I moved to San Francisco, and that was the first time I heard about startups. I did not know what that was before, and um, sounded interesting. So, did a startup um, a year ago, sold the startup, and I could do that for the rest of my life now. Um, just sit on the beach, do nothing. Um, so, for me, startups like I love startups, and. Um, I think it's weird that I, it, I never considered it as a career choice because I didn't even know what it was. Um, so I advocate startups. I think everyone should at least consider it as a career choice. Um, so one of the things I'm involved in is Silicon Beach Australia. There's a, there's a real community um, in Sydney and in Australia for people that are interested in startups. Uh, a lot of people do hobby projects on the side. 
um, you know, like go and talk to other people about it. You know, you never know, it might turn into something. Um, there is a mailing list, very active mailing list. Um, got about 1,400 people on there. Um, there's anywhere from like, you know, really experienced people, uh, there's lawyers, you know, accountants, any, any questions you have around doing startups, around starting businesses, um, very good advice there. Um, I saw there was a job board that was just launched on it. Um, every week we have drinks uh, at the uh, Grace Hotel. Um, we generally get anywhere between 25 to 120 people. Uh, it's been going for more than three years every single week. Oh. Um, there's a thing called open coffee for people that don't like to drink but like to get up earlier in the morning. Um, every two weeks, an un entrepreneurial meetup. Um, there's a thing called Sit Start. It'll be on 22nd of September. Great way also to get um, into the community. Um, push Start is a great way to find mentors. So if you, if you are starting a project and um, you're looking for people to mentor you that, that have more experience in it. Um, StartMate is a program that ran last year. Um, basically, five companies got 25 grand of investment. Uh, one of them, uh, Bugherd, is doing pretty well. They're, they're into 500 startups now, and they were just at a demo day. Oh. So anyway, if you want to know more about this, just send your email to my um, number, and I'll send you all the links and all the details, um, or contact me through some other way. Thanks. Awesome, awesome lightning talks. Let's see which one was the bestest. Okay, so uh, we've got a few things to get through, so don't disappear just as soon as we've done this. Um, right, so the ones that are actually eligible out of all this list for winning things are web application performance monitoring, scrape all the websites, callbacks versus structured code, girl geek coffees, Pi things, uh, Love Python, try Go, PyDoc.net, LCA 2012, Making the Internet More Better, and Silicon Beach Australia. So, pick your favorite or two favorites and make some noise. Uh, web Application Performance Monitoring. <laughs> Scrape all the websites. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the hair, isn't it? Okay, uh, callbacks versus structured code. Uh, Girl Geek Coffees, <laughs> Pie Things, <laughs> I think I detect bias, <laughs> Love Python, Try Go, <laughs> PyDoc.net, <laughs> uh, LCA 2012, <laughs> that's just the the pity vote for Ballarat, really. <laughs> uh, making the internet more better. And Silicon Beach, Australia. All right. Anthony. Really, thank you to everyone who um, contributed a lightning talk and to everyone who contributed a talk this entire weekend. I seem to have lost my bag. I need my dongle. Could I borrow a dongle, please, a VGA? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not how it works. <laughs> okay. Um, we also have another prize, a uh, couple of prizes to give away to the best talks for the weekend, as determined by the attendees of the conference. So, do we have, we'll, so we'll start off with the runner-up, I think, um, Peter Lovett yeah. for Dark Corners. 
Yeah. 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 Uh, it's 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 a last year collector's edition T-shirt signed by all of this year's speakers. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was the Python's Dark Corners talk, which was uh, so good. Um, it actually overloaded the air conditioning uh, and and overflowed the room. Um, but. Uh, the the favourite talk of a lot of people was Graham Cross with his machines that go bing. <laughs> so yeah, this is going to sit. The, I don't think the idea is you wear it, but there you go. <laughs> so uh, no, a T-shirt and a couple of books. Congratulations. Thank you. I just want to say the weekend is, well, firstly, thank you, but the weekend has been exceptionally inspirational, and I just would like us all to thank Richard and all the others who've put in vast amounts of work. Thank you. Um, I really, uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Um, we have to say thank you again to our sponsors who, you know, without their help, um, it would have been a hell of a lot more expensive for you all to come here. So uh, Google and Comops and Arclight, our gold sponsors, um, Anchor for sponsoring the video, our silver sponsors, um, Microsoft and Thought, Bitbucket, Python Software Foundation, uh, Wingware, Ninefold, the Django Software Foundation, GitHub for sponsoring the internet, and Linux Australia for really underwriting the whole thing and paying for our insurance. <laughs> so thank you to all of them. Okay, um, I've done that, I've done that. Okay, there's really not much else to say, um, except, uh, sorry? Uh, um, maybe. Um, <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, look, I have a list, okay, I'm getting to it. You're all throwing, there are things. Okay, the sprints, we have sprints on there on tomorrow and on Tuesday, downstairs in the hacking space. It's a room that's, that fits 30, I think we've had 20 people express interest so far, so there's a bit of extra room. Um, there's a whole bunch of ideas that people have got to, that people can help on, um, Python core, Django stuff, the cheese shop, um, and if you want to just come and hack on something yourself in the corner, that's fine too. Um, it's, you know, it's going to be a bunch of fun, um, and it's open from, oh, when does the door open down there? 8.30. 8.30 until like 11, okay? 10. 10. <laughs> I'm glad somebody knows what's going on. Yeah, 10, 10 p.m. Okay, so it's gonna, you know, if you want to, it can be a long day and it's gonna be a bunch of fun. Um, that's all the when we're house of that. Yep. Sorry. Um, oh, yes. Uh, uh, Nick, 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 Nick Coglin. Yes. Um, were you going to do something tonight for the, like, the pre flight for the core dev stuff or was that just gonna be tomorrow? Tomorrow, yep. No worries. Okay, he has Python dev in a box, which basically you install on your computer and you are a Python dev except without commit privileges, but we can work through that if you need it. Um, okay, so that's the sprints. Um, obviously, we want to do this again, and next year we have Chris Neugebauer, who is offered to run the next year's conference. Come up here. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, a couple of years ago, I found myself sitting on a couch in Wellington, New Zealand, near uh, Tim and Richard, who were talking about some far-fetched idea to run a Python conference in Australia. Um, and to think that it's got to 300 delegates in two years is a really fantastic achievement on their part. So everyone give them a round of applause. Right, so we're taking PyCon AU next year to Hobart in Tasmania. Uh, hopefully it will be sometime in August like it was this year, so uh, keep your diaries free and keep a lookout for announcements. We hope to see a whole heap of you there. It's gonna be really good. Thank you. Um, I think we do still have some uh, lost and found. Um. 
Yes, we still have some lost and found. If you've lost some keys, um, ask the lovely Kate. She's probably got your keys. Otherwise, she's going to be breaking into your house tonight and stealing all your stuff. Um, I'd like to specifically thank Kate, who's been on our Rego desk all day. Um, she's probably helped half of you with any problem you've had, so she's wonderful. I'd like to thank Neil, um, Kate's fiance, um, who's our treasurer. Um, of course, Richard, who. Um, Tried to make me run the conference and then didn't run away fast enough, so I managed to rope him into it as well. Um, we've also got um, Ryan Kelly, Mr. Rego. Um, if you have problems doing Rego, he helped you out. Um, he also did the voting app and some awesome talks. Um, Richard did the program, so blame him. Um, I'd also like to thank our AV guys. Um, you've got Ryan um, Werner over there. Um, he does awesome AV. If you've got a conference, talk to him. He'll make your AV like so much easier. And um, Ryan's helper up the back that I don't know the name of, I'm so sorry. Michael, thank Michael up the back. Um, and thank you, Tim, for organising all this on the ground here and all of the sponsors. <laughs> um, if you left stuff in the Ionic room, it is now under the Rego desk. Um, they're setting up in Ionic for another conference thing tomorrow, so we had to move everything out of there. So it, we haven't stolen your stuff. It's under the Rego desk. Um, uh, that there is James's iPad. Thank James for lending us a timer. James? James Polly. He's around somewhere. Uh, he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Um, yeah, James is a bit of an Apple fanboy and went to an opening and was the first person to buy an iPad in Australia. And now it's our lightning timer. Um, <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, come again next year. Um, Hobart, not here, not here. Um, Hobart is a wonderful place. I know it seems like a long way away, um, but it is awesome. The conference is going to be awesome. I'm getting a five minute sign, but I'm not going to take any more of your time. Um, please go away. I am exhausted. <laughs>